All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and today I'm giving you my impressions of the All-22 from the Falcons' Week 5 win over the New York Jets, looking at the reasons for Kyle Pitts' breakout, as well as answering your listener questions, focusing on the interior offensive line play so far this year. You are locked on Falcons. Your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at falcfans.com, RIP, still going strong on Twitter at falcfans, putting up re- weekly written content at the Falcoholic, the SB Nation website for the Atlanta Falcons, and of course, the host of this world-renowned Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Falcons your first listen of the day. Of course, Locked On Falcons is free and available on all podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify, and now also available in video format on YouTube. So go and subscribe to the new Locked On Falcons YouTube page so that you can catch all the action of this very handsome face. But today, this handsome face is going to be talking about the All-22 from the Falcons Week 5 win over the New York Jets. We'll give my general impressions of the All-22, and I didn't come away necessarily overly positive watching the film uh, of the Falcons, but we'll focus on Matt Ryan's performance. We'll talk about why Kyle Pitts had such a breakout. Then we'll move into the Q&A portion of today's episode, and we'll talk about the offensive line performances, focusing on Jalen Mayfield's development through five games this year. We'll talk about Matt Hennessy's projection as the long-term starter at the center position. Then we'll get into more questions later on talking about the potential switch of the safety position, whether we'll see more of Jalen Hawkins and Richie Grant moving forward. And then we'll focus quite a bit on power rankings, looking at the Locked On uh, Podcast Network's NFL power rankings and talk about who's the most overrated team. And we'll also talk about where the Falcons sort of fit on that power ranking radar and whether or not the Falcons might be a team poised to move up. But we'll start things off with my sort of general impressions of the All-22. And as I said earlier, I came away a little less impressed uh, from the Falcons' performance than when I watched it live. I don't want to necessarily diminish the Falcons' performance after watching the film, you know, but I tended to have a little bit more of that, oh, it's the Jets' reaction that I think a lot of people that were trying to belittle the Falcons' performance on Sunday did. You know, I think the Jets started this game playing very poorly. I don't want to discredit the Falcons. I think the Falcons absolutely took advantage of that, getting off to that 17 nothing lead. If the Falcons had only gotten off to like a 7 nothing lead or something like that, then I think the Falcons would be much more deserving of discrediting or d- diminishing their performance. But I think the Falcons f- definitely took advantage of the Jets' poor performance, and I think they made the plays early in this game to get out to that early lead. I think they made the plays late in this game to definitely earn the win. So I think the Falcons certainly deserve to win this game and outplay the Jets for the most part for the better part of four quarters. But, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was how poorly Zach Wilson played, particularly early in the game. You know, I didn't watch a ton of Washington football over the last couple of years, but when I generally did, I thought Mogan Morris's came away as one of the better right tackles in the NFL, and I thought he played particularly poorly in this game, uh, giving up a bunch of pressure to Dante Fowler and others uh, in this game. And, you know, Gerard Wilson was a safety, one of many Jets defenders that were blowing coverages in this game. And he was a safety that I I think they elevated to the practice squad this week, similar to what the Falcons did uh, with Chris Williamson and played a lot in terms of Wilson and struggled quite a bit in this game. Um, And those were some of my more notable Jets takeaways. Obviously, we're not talking about the Jets film. I want to talk about the Falcons film. And from a more positive standpoint, I do think Matt Ryan played absolutely well in this game. Maybe there's a couple of throws that he would have wanted back. Um, But particularly in the second half, I thought there were little to no complaints I had for Matt Ryan's performance. Pro Football Focus had Matt Ryan as the ninth most pressured quarterback in the league this past week in week five, but he also earned the highest grade as as far as a passer went when it came to being under pressure. And I think that was reflected in Matt Ryan's play film and play. Um, You know, this, I think, was one of the better games that Matt Ryan has had in terms of handling pressure going back to the, you know, 2018. I think you would have to go back where, you know, since 2018. 
handling pressure has been a consistent issue of Matt Ryan's. And I think this game against the Jets was one of his better performance. So hopefully we will continue to see Matt Ryan play at that level moving forward as he can build upon this season. But other positives, let's talk about how and why Kyle Pitts had his big game. You know, Pitts had six of his nine catches in the first half of this game. And I think the main reason for that was at least my impression was that the Jets came out of this game, came into this game playing a lot of man coverage in the first half. And consistently, Matt Ryan was looking for Kyle Pitts in those man coverage situations. There were times where the Jets did put their top corner on Pitts in those man coverage situations. And even then, Kyle Pitts was still able to get open on some of those plays. And so really, the Jets, if if Bryce Hall, their top corner, uh, couldn't cover Kyle Pitts, certainly the Jets had nobody else in their back seven uh, that could really handle that, that matchup. Now, I think in the second half of the game, the Jets started to make the adjustment and played a lot more zone. And that's why Kyle Pitts was a little bit quieter in the second half. But then, you know, the Falcons were able to attack that at times, particularly on that 39-yard bomb uh, where the aforementioned Jared Wilson seemed to be the culprit in blowing that coverage that led to uh, Kyle Pitts being wide open on that particular play. But, you know, I think the Falcons passing game, despite the adjustments that the Jets made, you know, it may have led to Kyle Pitts having a quieter second half, but you saw the Falcons wide receivers step up a lot more in the second half. That's where Tajay Sharp and Alameda Zacchaeus were making a lot more of their plays. Um, you saw Cordero Patterson make a lot of plays in the second half as a wide receiver, where according to pro football focus, 70% of his snaps as a route runner came as a wide receiver, either out wide or in the slot this past week as a wide receiver. So I think the Falcons offense was able to remain efficient when the Jets made that switch to the zone coverage, uh, in large part due to their wide receivers finding the opportunities to make up for, you know, the relatively limited impact that Kyle Pitts had with that adjustment. And, you know, we, we talked about Kyle Pitts and how he was moved around the formation uh, on yesterday's episode with our guest, Andy Gallagher. Um, and we talked about how Pitts has spent a lot of time playing in the slot and playing out wide, you know, looking at the pro football focus data, uh, he ran 38 snap. He ran routes on 38 snaps and was in the slot for 24% for 24 of those 38 snaps, which is over 60% of the snaps. And then he was lined up out wide on nine of those 38 snaps and then was in line as a tight end on five of those snaps. So clearly the Falcons are utilizing Kyle Pitts primarily as a receiver on roughly 80% of his snaps, at least this past weekend may given the injuries at the wide receiver position uh, that the Falcons are currently dealing with. And we'll see if they are still dealing with those a week from now, but those are, that's a, we may continue to see Kyle Pitts utilized primarily more as a wide receiver than necessarily a, a true uh, inline tight end moving forward. And, you know, you've heard me on the recent episodes talk quite a bit about the Falcons needing to add to that wide receiver position by going out there and getting a player like John Brown. Unfortunately, today on Tuesday, uh, that dream at least is no more for the foreseeable future with John Brown signing to the Denver Broncos practice squad, thus mitigating. Uh, The previous concerns I expressed on the podcast where I said that maybe the reason why the Falcons didn't sign John Brown initially was due to money. Obviously, John Brown is not making a ton of money on the Broncos practice squad. Uh, So it seems like money was not the issue there. Uh, So if the Falcons are going to add more help at the wide receiver position and particularly add some deep speed at that position, you know, it seems like it's Marvin Hall or bust at this point in time. But I do think given the performances of guys like Sharp and Zacchaeus in the second half, there's a little bit more confidence in this wide receiver group, especially if you can get Gage and Ridley if and when they come back from injuries um, or in whatever the personal matter that Calvin Ridley is dealing with, they can start playing better football, which is necessary. But I think if you're just looking for Sharp and Zacchaeus to be third and fourth wide receivers, third and fourth options at that wide receiver position, I think how they performed in the second half was like what you would want from that position group. And if that's all they have to be, and if we can see you know them play like they did in the third and fourth quarters for four quarters, then I think you will see some improvement from internally at this wide receiver position. So we're going to turn the page on the Falcons pass catchers and look towards the trenches as we get into the Q&A portion of today's Locked on Falcons episode, where we have several questions dealing with the offensive line, uh, talking about the play of Jalen Mayfield and Matt Hennessy and more coming up on today's episode. But I know many of you are listening to this stuck in bumper to bumper traffic in Atlanta. But wherever you call home, I know you wind up burning through a lot of gas. 
why not get some cash back at the pump so that you can save? You now can with a new app called Get Upside. When you open up a free account on Get Upside, you get 25 cents back per gallon every time you fill up. Over time, that kind of saving starts to add up with people making as much as two to $300 a month in cash back with Get Upside. You not only save, but you have multiple cash out options with a direct payment into your bank account with paypal you can get gift cards from amazon and many more sites available all the time and now when you open an account and use our special promo code touchdown you can get a bonus 25 cents back per gallon on your first fill up that's up to 50 cents back per gallon don't pay full price at the pump anymore download the free get upside app available in the app store or on google play and use our promo code touchdown when you sign up that's get upside promo code touchdown to start saving every time you fill up so our first question comes from Clem DB at Clem Frico on Twitter. He asks, I watched the whole game of Mayfield and I thought he played very well. Are you surprised by his development? What's your analysis for this offensive line game? Uh, so first, I'll give you my generally general impression of the offensive line performance in this Jets game. Again, going back to what I said earlier, I was not that impressed with the offensive line's performance. Um, you know, I think they certainly did their jobs. I think, you know, not allowing a sack. Uh, having the Falcons running game be mostly effective in this game, particularly relatively more effective this week than they have been in previous weeks, you know, certainly means that the offensive line did their jobs. But I felt like for all five starters, it was a very up and down performance. Even someone like Chris Lindstrom, who graded out particularly well this week, you know, I noticed how often he wound up on the ground. And that's generally not a good thing for an offensive lineman. And so that's just something that Chris Lindstrom, even though he is playing well this year, that's something that he needs to work on cleaning up. You can't block anybody if you're on the ground. As for Jalen Mayfield, you know, to me, he was fine. You know, I think the thing with Jalen Mayfield is that if he's the 56th best guard in a given week, which, you know, based off of some of his pro football focus metrics as a pass protector was the case this past week against the Jets, he gets a thumbs up, right? And, you know, it's essentially a question of was Jalen Mayfield an absolute disaster this week? If the answer is no, then OK, he played well. And, you know, I think when you ask, am I surprised by his development? No, because I still think he's one of the worst guards in the NFL. Um, is he a massive liability like he was the first two games of the season? No. Is he still a small liability? Yes. And I think maybe at some point later this year, he may not be a liability at all. Um, and if he is you know, if he reaches that point, then great. That's a great sign of his development. But I don't think we're close to that point quite yet. Uh, moving on to Sports Sandwich's question. He asks, has Hennessy shown enough to show you that he is the long-term answer? Um, you know, I'm assuming by the long-term answer you mean, will Hennessy be that guy beyond his rookie contract? And right now I would say the answer is no. Basically, there to me, there are three things that you need from uh, the starting center uh, in terms of this outside zone blocking scheme uh, that you want to see from Hennessy before you can answer if he's the long term uh, option. You know, the first one is how does he handle uh, one on one blocking assignments, both as a run blocker and pass protector, pass protector, particularly against more powerful defensive tackles. The second one is what is his ability to climb to the second level as a run blocker and be that heat seeking missile to take out linebackers there and open up those cut back run lanes that you need in the outside zone blocking scheme. And the third thing is what is his ability to make the line calls in terms of the protections, particularly against blitzes. Um, and I think look at Alex Mack, right, as a litmus test. And I'm not expecting Matt Hennessy to be Alex Mack, but when you looked at Alex Mack during his five years in Atlanta, he checked those first two boxes, right? The one-on-one -on -one blocking and the second level blocking, and he checked those to a huge degree. In terms of the third um, box, he didn't really check that. He was kind of middling. When, you know, contrary to popular opinion, the Falcons really struggled against the Blitz over the course of the five years that Alex Mack was the starter. And so I think, you know, Mack wasn't great in that arena. And obviously towards the end of his tenure, you know, those first two boxes, you know, became checked less frequently. But I think with Alex Mack, he was able to, at least early on the first three or so years, check these first two boxes so much that you didn't mind the fact that the third box was just kind of iffy, right? And I think with in regards to Matt Hennessy, he hasn't really checked any of those boxes. You know, I think when you talk about that first one, the one-on-one -on -one blocking, you know, I don't think he's probably ever going to really check that. He's not a overly powerful or physical player. 
And I think that's consistently shown up this season each and every Sunday when it comes to him blocking, especially those bigger, more powerful defensive tackles one-on-one. I think he can certainly get better there. But as I outlined when we initially drafted Matt Hennessy, I think your best case scenario is probably a scenario where you're going to continue to see him struggle for a handful of games each and every year, uh, particularly against maybe, you know, divisional opponents like Tampa Bay and Carolina because they have guys like Vita Vea and Derek Brown in the middle of their defense. But, you know, your hope is that outside of those games for the like, say, the other 70 percent of his performances, you know, he does a pretty adequate job of holding his own. I think that's kind of his ceiling. And I don't think he right now he's really shown that he's on the path to reaching that ceiling. But obviously, time will tell on that. You know, so I think really when you're looking at Matt Hennessy, you're looking at him checking that second in that third box uh, in terms of making up for that. And, you know, like I said with Alex Mack, if you're, he's checking two of those three boxes, then you can kind of forgive him lacking in the third one. And I think thus far in terms of his performance this year, in terms of his second level blocking, he's been kind of underwhelming there. You know, that was not something that he was great at at Temple. You know, I think he certainly has the athleticism to be that heat seeking missile that you want there. But he's his finesse style of play tends to be that he doesn't always consistently hit those assignments when he is in a position to take out that linebacker. The linebacker is able to shed that block and wind up potentially making the play. And that prevents these runnings, these runs from being, you know, they might go for five yards instead of going for 15 yards like they should if he had hit that assignment. Um, You know, I think the protections have been a problem, you know, particularly with the blitz all year long. Again, hopefully you're hoping he can improve in that with more experience. But, you know, these were some of the factors why I had a little bit more of an optimistic opinion that Drew Davis going into preseason could wind up unseating uh, Hennessy because, you know, while you could probably give Hennessy the edge in terms of the mental side when it comes to protections, given his adding experience, you know, I think even though Drew Dahlman was also undersized and so therefore that first box in terms of the one-on-one blocking is probably not going to be a box that he's going to check, I think the fact that he has better grip strength um, and arguably better athleticism means that in terms of those second level blocks, uh, he has the potential to do a better job on that. And when he's in position, he can hit those assignments because he can lock on to a, a linebacker in space. And so we'll see how it, how it develops. But I think, you know, Dalman is still in a position where he could potentially, you know, whether we probably not this year, but in 2022 and 2023, especially if he can make up ground in terms of making those line calls, you could see Drew Dalman surpassing Matt Hennessy and be, you know, in a position that will make it so that it's going to be hard for Matt Hennessy to get that second contract when he becomes a free agent in 2024. Now, this isn't me writing off Matt Hennessy by any means. You know, I think there's certainly, um, you know, an opportunity for him to grow as a player, but I just think he's a ways away from locking down that center position in terms of, you know, being etched in stone there. Um, and again, it's not to say that he can't improve won't improve but if you're asking me today you know is he there no um if you're asking me if i'm going to bet big money on him getting there eventually i would say no and again i'm pulling this number out of my butt when i say this but like i would basically the number i would pull is to say like right now if you're asking me today this is subject to change in the future but if you're asking me today you know i would say there's probably like a 38 percent chance that matt hennessy is going to be that long-term starter All right. That's significantly better than zero, but it wouldn't be great betting odds at this point in time. So obviously that again, that number is subject to change in the future. Just sort of have to see. And so this is a good question to ask me, you know, five weeks from now uh, in terms of what have I seen from Matt Hennessy in terms of growth uh, over the 10 weeks uh, as opposed to, you know, the first five weeks. So we'll see how he gets there. We'll see where Jalen Mayfield is you know, a month or so from now. But to me, this offensive line still is very much a work in progress. That includes Kayla McGarry as well. We won't get to talk about Kayla McGarry today, but we might get to him uh, talking about him tomorrow. But as we continue today's episode, you know, I do want to switch to the defensive side of the ball to talk a little bit more about the safety position, have a conversation about Jalen Hawkins and Richie Grant potentially being named the starters at that safety position later this year. Uh, we'll also get into the locked on NFL power rankings, looking at who's overrated and where the sort of Falcons stand in that regard. But 
Before we get there, I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Falcons your first listen of the day. But here are some suggestions for your second listen of the day. Check out Locked On Raiders. Check out the Locked On NFL show and get the latest on John Gruden's dismissal in Las Vegas. Uh, like Locked On Falcons, Locked On Raiders, and Locked On NFL are free and available on all podcast platforms, including YouTube. So we're talking about Matt Hennessy and Jalen Mayfield, and maybe they can make strides if they can get more protein into their diet, and they can do that without having to sacrifice flavor by eating Built Bars, the best tasting protein bar on the market. Built Bars come in several delicious flavors, including my favorite coconut almond, and perhaps you prefer cookies and cream, cherry barcia, double chocolate, peanut butter brownie, salt caramel, or one of the limited time flavors like cherry lime, cherry puff, or churro puff, I'm sorry, strawberry puff, apple, almond, Chris, and the latest limited flavor, Rocky Road, all available right now at Built.com. Built bars are great because they taste just like a candy bar containing 100% real chocolate. They're soft and easy to chew, but you get none of the guilt of eating a candy bar because Built Bars are healthy too. They're low in sugar and calories, high in protein and fiber. Go order yourself some today by heading over to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your first order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. So we have three related questions. First one comes from Sports Sandwich. The other one comes from Johnny at Johnny Eddie one on Twitter and from Steel at Pitts Supremacy one. Sports Sandwich asks, do you see Jalen Hawkins getting more playing time moving forward regardless of injuries? Johnny asks, do you expect to see more of Richie Grant going forward? And Steel asks, do you think Hawkins and Grant could become the starting safeties before the end of the season? So to answer all your questions, I think it's certainly possible, uh, if potentially probable. You know, I thought Jalen Hawkins did a really solid job in this Jets game. He was one of the standout defenders on the defensive side of the ball. It wasn't like he was incredible, but he consistently did his job in this game and then obviously had that big play on the interception. Um, I thought, you know, looking at I thought his play was particularly poor. You know, I've been somewhat a Deron Harmon defender um, despite some ups and downs and questionable play in the first month of the season. But I think this week five game, at least based off of the film I've watched, uh, was absolutely his worst game. He was consistently out of position. He was making bad reads. He was showing poor awareness um, consistently in this game. And, you know, that's something that you really can't have, especially when you are looking at his reputation as a steady, reliable, experienced veteran on the back end. Um, you know, the Falcons worked out a safety in Will Parks today. He's another veteran safety that you would assume could add some depth uh, with Eric Harris out of the lineup with that calf injury. Parks has some experience also dabbling as a nickel cornerback these last couple of years in Denver. We saw the Falcons add Sean Williams to their practice squad last week once Harris went down with that calf injury. So it does suggest maybe that Eric Harris's imminent return is not likely next week, but we'll see. Um, you know, if that's the case, then I think we'll continue to see Jalen Hawkins. Um, you know, I think assuming that he can continue to play well, you know, I imagine at the very least, if not taking one of these starting jobs, whether that's Harris or Harmon, um, you would see him at least rotated a lot more into the lineup with those two guys, even if Harris does return sooner rather than later. As for Richie Grant, I did come away a little less impressed of Grant's performance on the All-22 uh, based off of, you know, compared to my initial reaction live, um, there were just a, a few too many times he looked a little lost in the back end for me to be overly positive about his play. I don't think he played poorly by any means. Um, I think, again, he probably among the several other players in the secondary did his job for the most part. But there were a couple of times where I'm like, oh, he was a little lost. Maybe this explains why the team was a little reluctant to play him early in the season because they didn't necessarily trust him. But as I said earlier, Deron Harmon was also very lost. And so. I think you're you're looking at that situation where if if you're only going to get that much from Deron Harmon, what do you have to lose with putting Richie Grant back there at this point in time? So my assumption is for now, I think Richie Grant will continue to get opportunities at the nickel cornerback spot over the safety position because I don't think Darren Hall really did a lot in this game to inspire much confidence for with him going forward. And I don't think Avery Williams did much in the previous week's game against Washington that inspired a ton of confidence. So I think you know, Grant is going to continue to get reps at the nickel spot because you're not in really any rush to play one of these other guys there or, or there are any immediate better options for you there. So you might as well continue to kick Richie Grant's tires there. But I do think in terms of 
seeing both of these guys continue to get more playing time? Yes, I think the answer is yes, that we will continue to see both of these guys get more playing time. And in terms of their potential to both be starting safeties or potentially having Grant being a starting nickel and Hawkins be a starting safety, yeah, I think the potential is reasonably high that unless you can get significantly better play from uh, Harmon or and, and Harris, as well as potential other options at that nickel quarterback position, yeah, I think we could see both of these guys starting. Our next question comes from Ryan at R. Hopkins on Twitter. He asks, name five Falcons. Ryan, well, you just know that's an impossible task. We'll move on to CD3224's question. He asks, are the Panthers the most overrated team in the NFL? No, I, you know, and I, I may be basing this a little bit too off of the Locked On Podcast Network NFL power rankings, but the Panthers are, are kind of considered to be a middle of the pack team. And I feel that that's where they kind of belong. Let's look at those power rankings. You know, if you're on YouTube right now, you can see them. Um, I'll just have to talk about them uh, for you audio listeners. But again, that's another reason to subscribe to the Lockdown Falcons on YouTube. So the Panthers are 17th in the current um, locked on NFL power rankings. And that feels right for them. You know, they're one of the lower ranked three and two teams. You know, their defense played really well against some arguably subpar offenses in the first three games. And then they've come back down to earth these last couple of weeks against Dallas and Philadelphia. And you've also coupled that with Sam Darnold looking more like the Sam Darnold of New York uh, with several turnovers in these last couple of games. But I think for me, the team that stands out as the most overrated for me is not Carolina, but it's the Kansas City Chiefs. If you're looking at these power rankings, they're currently ranked ninth. Um, would I sit here and say that the Chiefs are probably the best team with a losing record so far this season? Sure. But um, I feel like nine is way too high based off of how they performed this year. I certainly think the Chiefs ceiling is very high, uh, considerably the, the potential that they have. You know, if you went back and listened to that season preview episode I did right before week one, I talked about some of my misgivings about this Chiefs defense in particular, which has been atrocious this year. I didn't think they would be this bad, but I did think that they had the potential to be very bad. But I also assumed in that episode, uh, predicting that the Chiefs, I think, to win like 14 games this year was due to the fact that I thought their offense was going to be, you know, one of the better offenses in the league and make up for it. And their offense is, I think, a top five offense in terms of scoring output, but they've struggled with getting off this, these very slow starts this year. And we've seen that kind of be the norm for the Chiefs the last couple of years, and they always kind of figure it out in the second or third quarter and can score in bunches. Um, but given how poorly their defense has played and, and getting into these holes and their offense has not responded as capably in those second and third quarters to, to basically score 21 points out of nowhere like we've seen them do and ha have success in previous years and that has led to them being kind of a middling team so i wouldn't necessarily put the chiefs down really low on these power rankings but you know certainly i think they're probably closer to being like in that 15 range than certainly being in the top 10. there's no way that i would put them over the browns even though they beat the browns in week one the Browns are, are an ascending team and the Chiefs are a very much descending team as far as that is concerned. So that's where we'll leave it with the most overrated. Team. We'll continue to talk about these power rankings into Johnny, uh, John Eddie's one second question. He has, have you got any thoughts on what our final record will be judging off of these first five game performances and sports sandwich has a, another question uh, similar to that, which is the best guess for how many wins you need to get into the playoffs this year in the NFC. So to answer Sports Sandwich's question, um, I feel like nine and eight is probably what you're looking at. You know, I feel like when we talk about the Falcons potential record this year, you know, I think their floor at this point in time is like six wins. You know, I think they should be expected to win four more games this year. I think their ceiling is probably nine wins. I would be surprised if the Falcons did, fared better than seven and four the rest of the season. Um, you know, I think you're looking in terms of the the four wins that you do expect to see from this team. I think you're licking your chops when it comes to um, the, the Lions in Jacksonville, right? Those are two wins right there. I think you're expecting to get two wins in the division, um, probably splitting with Carolina and uh, New Orleans. And if you only get one, then I think you're probably getting your second win from Miami, which is probably the most winnable of uh, the non-Lions, Jaguars, and, and divisional games moving forward. So I, I feel good about saying the Falcons will probably go like 7-10 and 10 if they can beat Miami, um, you know, coming out of their bye week. But, you know, I think outside of those, you know, three games, uh, outside of division and potentially, you know, Carolina and New Orleans, 
uh, inside the division, there's not too many easy wins that I feel real confident about the Falcons moving forward. Um, so, you know, looking at the Falcons power rankings, they moved up one spot from 27 to 26 now. And, you know, we've talked quite a bit about the Falcons showing steady progress over the course of the season and getting back to this topic about the Falcons performance against the Jets. Obviously, the Jets are a bottom three team um, in the power rankings, and I think that's a deserved ring. And the Falcons are the seventh worst team in terms of the power rankings. And I feel like that's fair for where I feel like the Falcons are right now. Like, that's why I'm not overly positive about the Falcons performance, because it, it felt like, oh, the 26th best team just beat up on the 30th best team. And the 30th best team probably played like a team that looks more like the 32nd best team, at least in the first half of that game. And the Falcons took advantage of that. And I think we'll have to sort of see the Falcons continue to show progress and they have each and every week. Um, and we'll see if that gets reflected in the power rankings. Let, let's imagine that they can move up one spot as they have done this week, every week for the next eight games, right? If that is the case, then you're looking at a power ranking somewhere in that 18 range, you know, by the time we get to the final month of the season, the final four games of the season. And that's at least theoretically, you would assume that the Falcons would probably pick up at least four more wins at that point and be like six and seven going into that final month at least, you know, theoretically that's a team that's in striking distance to potentially finish in the top 12 or 14 teams and possibly be, you know, a playoff team. Um, so again, despite not loving that film against the, the Jets, I think the Falcons did move the needle some. Uh, hopefully we can continue to see them needle even further. But, you know, talking about the Falcons in the playoffs, you know, I think they're a long way away from that. I don't, I don't want anybody to take make it seem like I'm saying, oh, I think the Falcons are on the path to making the playoffs. But I'm saying like, if they continue to show progress, then they may be, you know, a month or two from now. Um, and I think, you know, some of, some of the issues that we've already discussed on today's episode, particularly the offensive line, um, the safety position, you need to see continued progress at those areas. We need to see continued progress at the cornerback group. We need to see better pass rush. We need to see improvement from the running game, the wide receiver group, et cetera. And of course, we need to see Matt Ryan be able to maintain his current level of play for the most part uh, for the remainder of this season in order for that team, where, when we're talking about the Falcons potentially being one of these middle of the pack teams, being ranked somewhere where, you know, the Panthers are currently, where the Falcons could be there, you know, in a month or two. You know, if those things improve, then the Falcons are on the path to get there. But again, that's a lot of hurdles. That's a lot of hills to climb. That's a lot of areas of this roster that need to be better. And so I think when we're looking at this team currently, they're not there yet, but they can potentially get there if they can get improvement from those various units moving forward. And they can start shrinking the gap between themselves and several of these other teams ranked much higher on their power rankings than currently. So we'll just sort of have to see what happens. And there are still plenty of questions to answer about this team from you, the listeners. And because we don't have to do a crossover Thursday tomorrow, uh, we can get into that um, episode and talk, answer more of these questions. And some of those include, you know, talking about Caleb McGarry uh, and my assessment of his performance so far. And some people asked about the potential of the Falcons being, you know, sellers on the trade market as we get to midseason. And I think that is part of the conversation when we talk about where are the Falcons going to be a month from now when the trade deadline hits, right? You know, how, are they going to win one out of their next four games or could they win? Could they split those games? Could they go three and one over the next four months? And that will certainly determine uh, that. Uh, but we can get into those questions potentially on tomorrow's episode. Uh, and that's where we'll leave it, guys, on today's Locked On Falcons, uh, all 22 review and Q&A. And before we duck out of here, if you want to send in your questions for future Q&As and submit them potentially to be answered on tomorrow's episode, of course, you can do so by hitting me up on Twitter at Locked On Falcons, on Facebook at Locked On Falcons, or you can send an email to LockedOnFalcons at mail.com. And guys, um, before we duck out of here, make sure that you the Peacock and Williamson podcast, where if you want to get additional insight into, you know, all the things going on with John Gruden, as well as the other 32 NFL teams, get that insight and analysis from NFL analyst Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson every day on the Peacock and Williamson podcast. And of course, it's free and available on all podcast platforms. Guys, I appreciate you for tuning in for another episode of Locked on Falcons. We'll be back with more tomorrow. Appreciate it. Until then.